That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion <laughs> is advised. I'm Shane Ramey. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh-oh, thanks for having me. If you're looking to quit drinking, go to thatsoberguy.com. We have lots of resources there. Uh, you can check out all of those. And then be sure to follow us on Instagram at That Sober Guy Podcast. All the links from today's show will be in the show notes, so they're easy for you to find. And of course, a lovely shout out to Humans Music for the intro music. Always love those guys. Be sure to check them out as well. Really excited for our guest today. I was trying to find out when, this is his second time appearing on the show, but it's been a few years. I'm thinking 20, 2016, 2017, somewhere around there. Uh, but it's great to have him back. His name is Bob Forrest, and I'm sure you've uh, possibly heard of him before if you have paid attention to the recovery community. Uh, he's been a counselor on VH1 Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew. He's also a spokesperson for DNA for Addiction, uh, and he's had a long journey uh, in his own struggle with addiction, been to rehab facilities, uh, many, many times, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'll just, it's also, man, just an old school punk rocker and music connoisseur, which I love uh, from the bands Thelonious Monster and Bicycle Thief. So, really cool with uh, my love for music and uh, always, always love to talk to uh, good dudes who have that in common. So, Bob, it's great to have you on the podcast today, man. How are you? Well, thanks for having me. I think I, I, I don't remember doing a recorded one, but I remember doing the Sober Guy podcast before it had video. So I yeah. might have done it. I think I might have done it two times in a lot since you started. You, you may have. I'm gonna have to yeah, go back and I look did. because I know it was, it was probably just audio back then, like you're mentioning. Yeah, audio I, one, and maybe I did a video one in sixteen. But yeah, but you know, I've, I've just. Since I started trying to stop in 1987, my life has been just devoted to recovery and getting high, basically, <laughs> for nine years back and forth until yeah. 96 when I did finally get sober. So I've been, what you would say, in the 12-step community since 1987. And I think I went to meetings even before that. I think my friend Brendan Mullen, who is the guy who brought punk rock to America, to Los Angeles. He had a club mm. called The Mask. I remember him taking me to an AA meeting in like 84. So oh, we're wow. talking about 40 years of this, this yeah. nonsense. <laughs> Back and forth, man. Hey, yeah. what, what, what was that like? Like going, cause I, I remember that myself going to a meeting and knowing that I had some issues that needed to be dealt with, but still resisting. Do you remember what that was like going to those meetings? I remember like before? vividly. Well, I even went to an AA meeting in high school. So this is an interesting thing. I've had a drinking problem since the moment I started drinking, really. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a great way to put know, it. I don't know about these people that are debating when they're in rehab, whether they have a problem. I always knew I had a problem. The question was what to do about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I had a high school English teacher that I loved. And I used to, in uh, like junior in high school, I would go to Del Taco get a big Del Taco cup of uh, Coke and then pour Bacardi in and go to class like mm. in my junior year of high school. But I held it together. I had two jobs. I lived on my own. I li I've been lived on my own since I was 17. I'm pretty, pretty hard worker. So, yeah. you know, like drinking hadn't interrupted that or drugs hadn't interrupted that. So anyways, I'm drinking Bacardi and Coke in class, 10 a.m. in on a Friday in high school. And my English teacher, um, she said, Robert, could you stay after class for a second? And I was her favorite people because I'm a big reader and I, you know, I love books. And yeah. so I, I, you know, I waited after and she, she said, what's in your drink? And I said, what, you know, I knew what she was talking about. I said, oh, oh okay, am I in trouble? <laughs> and she said, no. Are you in trouble? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and I said, you got to understand, this would be 1978. Yeah. This is not 2024 yeah. where no teachers want to overstep or get yeah. a lawsuit or something. I thought maybe you were um, going to say, uh, she said, can, can I have a sip? <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, back no. then, we you never you know, right? This. Okay, let's we go. Let's go. Sorry. <laughs> so she says, um, do you think you have a problem with that? And I said, am I in trouble? Like, I, I didn't understand if I was in trouble, why she wasn't walking me to the office. And she said, I just want to know, 
because I have a problem with that stuff. Oh, wow. And I go to a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. Have you ever heard of it? My English teacher said this to me when I was a junior in high school. Wow. And I said, no, well, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know what you're saying. And she said, I'm going to go to a meeting tonight in Laguna Beach. I was in Huntington Beach at, at uh, Marina High School right oh, there wow. where you yeah. used to live. Yep. And she said, I'm going to go to one of my meetings. I would meet you there if you'd like to come. Like, when has that ever happened nowadays? Could you imagine? Like, Can yeah. you imagine the lawsuit? Oh, yeah. Sexual harassment? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Anything. So... Turns it, you know, I was a pretty knowledgeable person. I was going up to Hollywood and seeing bands, and I, I read a lot and whatever. And I knew she was a lesbian. I didn't really know what a lesbian was, but I was very interested in any kind of walk of life that was different than yeah. my white Republican growing up. <laughs> yeah. So I said, sure, I want to go, mostly because I wanted to know what her world was like, mm -hmm. not go to the say Amy. I remember we met at a Denny's in Laguna Beach and then we went to an AA meeting and she was there with her girlfriend and I just was so into like learning about a new world her world and then lo and behold I go to this AA meeting and who's AA meeting is it Chuck C the no guy way. who wrote new pair of glasses oh shoot <laughs> got me come on yeah the guy who said He'd look out at the ocean and think, even if it was all whiskey, it wouldn't be enough, yeah. right? One of my idols in recovery, Chuck C. So I was 17, I went to a meeting, and but I remember walking out of there thinking, this is cool for old people, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? When yeah. I get old, I don't mind coming here. <laughs> but right <laughs> but now, I'm about to not party. not old, <laughs> I am on my way. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no youth recovery movements in 1978. You know, it was a bunch yeah. of old, old people. And, but it was, it was a world that I was interested in. So the first time I ever got introduced to it, I was interested in, I'm interested in any way that people are living that's different than the status quo. I've always yeah. been that way. I, you know, it gets harder and harder to find people who are, living alternative lifestyles or alternative yeah. things because everything's so mainstream i mean i think i think you know moving to idaho i mean during covid so many of my friends said they were going to move away mm. and none did yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> so how outlaw are we living yeah and but when i was young you know you'd say oh, well let's go to san francisco i'd be like let's go like yeah. i'd call in sick to work and drive to san francisco with whoever was at the party i just wanted to go live and experience things and drugs and alcohol fueled all that yeah. they didn't diminish it they fueled it yeah that's the thing that regular people don't understand about addicts and alcoholics is it gave us so much then it gets to a point of diminishing returns yeah it's, it's taking away at a certain point, but we always remember when it gave so much. Oh yeah. There, yeah. There, there was fun times for sure. But at, at some point it doesn't, yeah, we, it, be, it becomes not fun anymore. And, and you know, yeah. And it starts to take away. Yeah. Like you're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. And then you're trapped. And I mm -hmm. was trapped like that for years and years though. I could still being a musician is a pretty good job to have if you're an alcoholic drug addict. Like you, you only got to show up once in a while. <laughs> and oh, yeah. if you don't show up, sometimes it's okay. <laughs> yep. No, yeah. I remember, I, yeah. I, I remember, you know, back in that era when the Chili Peppers and Thelonious Monster and Fishbone and Jane's Addiction all started, you know, there were shows that Anthony didn't show up and Keith Morris of the Circle Jerk sang and they got through the set or whatever. There was times... I took too much acid and I couldn't play an app and he sang, he knew most of my songs and he sang the ones he knew. And then Angelo from Fishbone sang, I, I wandered off. I ended up like by the freeway mm -hmm. and this friend of mine, Brett Gerwitz, who's in bad religion pulled over and said, what are you doing, Bob? And I was just walking along the freeway, <laughs> just Lord. tripping on like four hits of brown Damn. acid, like looking at all the lights of the freeway. Wow. So, you know, we all had problems and we all kind of were a community together. That what's so sad nowadays is there's no drug community. Mm. There there's no camaraderie amongst addicts. They're all yeah. in their isolated chambers getting their drugs off the internet and Instagram mm. and and the drug dealers don't like 
you know, I had drug dealers. You had to maintain a relationship with them. You were it was completely a business and relationship. wholly dependent on them. <laughs> yeah. It was a real relationship yeah. in your life. And, you know, I would have to go on tour and usually my partners were drug addicts and, and, you know, many of my drug dealers would look out for my girlfriends when I was gone on tour and just make sure, you know, make sure to have somebody go by and, and mm. make sure she's okay. That's not the relationship the kids that are clients of mine in rehab are having. Yeah. They start, they, I, I remember 10, 15 years ago, there was this like normal, like girl from a upper middle class family in Huntington beach, by the way, on the cliffs there. And she was an intravenous drug user. And I was so shocked mm. at like, how did she learn it? And she told me on the internet, like she learned how to shoot Dang. up watching it. She's YouTube like YouTube, video. just Google YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, you really I mean, can do anything how, on YouTube, I guess. How from, lonely? Wow. And, yeah, I guess you can learn anything. But how lonely and sad are drug yeah. addicts' lives these days? It 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 is not the life that yeah led to that 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 I lived and my friends you, lived. It was you a think, community. It was yeah. Do you, do you think what? that there's any? Um, do you think that like the evolution of the drugs of the substances and the, um, the severity of them has, has kind of done, um, or it, maybe that's one of the effects of that, like fentanyl, yeah. for instance, like think, it's well, so powerful. It, yeah. It's so different now that it really does even more to, to the body physically, mentally, emotionally. Well, for sure. Like if you start like just for instance, you know, most exposures in the 70s, 80s, 90s are marijuana. That's your first exposure. Yeah, yeah. Or alcohol, right? When your first exposure is fentanyl-laced Xanax at Damn. 13 or 14, I mean, there's nowhere to go but down. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, Gosh. and you're in rehab when you're a minor, right? There's mm -hmm. all these, you know, teen rehabs and stuff, and you're – in continuation school and your life is over before it even began before you mm. learn the fun i always say a lot of these kids that i'm dealing with they don't have the fundamentals mm. because they became addicts so early in life like at 13 14 15 you don't know the fundamentals of like how life works yeah how relationships work how cars work how long how washer and dryers work mm. i had like the same girl stuff. that was the intravenous drug user who who learned how to shoot up on YouTube, she didn't know how to use a washing machine mm. in rehab. Really? Like, didn't know how it worked. And I was like, wow, you talk about arrested development. <laughs> yeah. Drugs are robbing these kids from their, from their life experience, like how a washing yeah. machine works or how you get car insurance. Mm. Like, I, I've had to help kids get driver's licenses. They they don't even know what the DMV is. Wow. They just in, been anesthetized from drugs since they were 14 or 15. And so the good news is if they don't die, they get sober at a much earlier age. I got mm -hmm. sober at 35. Most of my friends got sober at 28, 29, 30, 32, yeah. right? Kids are getting sober at 19, 20, 22, 24. Because if, you know, and you think about it, you're in a rehab at 15, you know, you're bound to go in and out, go in and out for say five years. You're going to be sober at 20 if you live. Right. Yeah. And so you, there's, there's, I always say that it's a sad and beautiful world is what Joe Strummer used to always say. He was a hero of mine, friend of mine, the singer of the clash. Mm. He used to say, it's a sad and beautiful world. Thelonious. And, uh, and it is, it's a sad and beautiful world. And I yeah. think kids nowadays only think it's a sad world. Mm. Yeah. And we've I, got to help them see the beauty of the world. Yeah. Right. And that's what sobriety should be. That's why I don't mind whatever somebody's, I used to be pretty rigid about things, mm. you know, I don't know why, even though I'm a flexible guy, like sobriety to me was a very serious thing. And it was, you had to surrender, you had to turn your will over. I didn't care if you believe in God. I don't believe in God, but you have to turn your will over. And nowadays I'm not so rigid about things like whatever works to get kids going in the right direction to get, you know, addicts going in the right direction, whatever works. Hmm. And I mean, whatever, 
you know, there's this California sobriety. Like, yeah, I heard of that. It's better than dying of fentanyl. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'll give you. Yeah. I'll give you that. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so it's been evolution, and and but there still is this traditional kind of way that people get sober through the twelve step world. I mean, I'll say it through AA. Um, uh, my son's three years sober. My oldest son. Oh, nice. And. He was telling me, Dad, you ever been to late night? And I was like, yeah, I invented late night. (laughs) Here you go, son. Let me school you real quick. And I go, go, you mean the one on La Brea and Sunset? And he goes, no, there's a new version. And apparently, it's like even crazier than late night. And for those that don't know what late night is, in Southern California, we have these meetings at 10 o'clock at night in Hollywood where you can cross talk, you can insult the speaker <laughs> all kinds of fun been to it? i've have never been, been to a late to night one now we went have to one about it i've heard of it never been though yeah it's crazy i used to love it because it you know fun. you know you work all day you go to a 7 30 meeting it's out at nine like what are you gonna do like you go eat and then we would just go to late night and get there late because there's no <laughs> rules to it nobody's gonna judge you <laughs> if you get to a 10 o'clock meeting at 10 45 no one's gonna say anything yeah. they're yelling at the speaker to i'm like i was a speaker one time they told me to shut up <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm the speaker, and they're like, we don't care. Shut up. Yeah, that's like the ultimate punk rock <laughs> meeting. It's like all anarchy. It really just is. here it is. Just it's show up. Like, like whenever the hell you get I there. I always tell you, it's the funnest thing. If if you'll you can test your prudishness and your preciousness about AA if you go to late night. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. There's nothing right about it. Yeah. <laughs> except for everyone's there. Yeah. And everyone's trying to be sober. Yeah. Right. Well, but, uh, I think it, it, know, it kind of LA goes back has... to it kind of goes back to what you were saying, though, earlier, man, is like, OK, the rules, the regulations, the societal like, uh, you know, conforming to the, you know, every day. What here's what you're supposed to do at the end of the day. It kind of comes back to community. So you're, you're you're bringing that community again together and the people are together. And that's really kind of the basis. Like I work with so many dudes who. They're trying to do this stuff alone. Most of them are alcohol. That's their issue. Right. Um, but they're trying to do it alone. They're, they don't have a, a group. They don't, ha- they don't have any source of community. Most of them, they don't have a mentor, a coach, a sponsor. They're just trying to just almost white knuckle it. And I've been there. I did the same thing for many years before I was able to finally, um, you know, finally quit. Well, don't you 100%. think that's what I'm saying is there's no, there's no community. Yeah, Totally. It's in, in using anymore. Well, right. I, so I think media and so technology we used to, we has used to smoke. I'll give you an example. All the kids that like pot used to smoke pot after little league practice. Right. <laughs> so we'd have, I I'd be in pony league or whatever. And some other kid would be in the regular little league or whatever. And all the stoners, there was this, this line of trees behind the fields where we played. And as our practices were over, we'd just go over there and then it's six or eight of us to get over there and smoke a joint or whoever had pot or whatever. And it was such a sense of community. I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah. but we were also playing baseball and getting yelled at and had yeah. coaches that were, we looked up to and, yeah. and kids nowadays are not doing that. Not yeah. enough. They're not doing it enough. I'm laughing because right. I'm just thinking of like, Bob, turn two. Hold on, coach. I'm going to go smoke this joint real quick. <laughs> yeah. when are we I'll be, be right done? back. I got to get to the, I gotta get to the, uh, yeah. the College of the Desert in Palm Desert. There's a oh, big man. line of trees and we would go, you know, and and I don't know if the coaches knew, but they knew who yeah. the stoners were. And we were most of the best baseball players in the desert. There so you go. They yeah. That's funny. Well, it reminds me, I went Matt, back and oh, watched the bad news. the greatest – have you watched Bad News Bear real quick? Players. Bad News Bears. Do you remember that? Remember that yeah. movie? Like I that went was, back and that watched that. Yeah, and, and like to get the the stuff that happened then. If that was going on now, like it's so crazy. Just you know it, that was just normal. But you're right. There, there. De- it was definitely harder. It's definitely different. But there was there definitely was a big community. sense of community, no doubt. There was and. Uh, another thing that happens when a kid gets snatched up at a young age, they get thrown into these programs where there's no baseball. There's no like, yeah. there's no like shop class. There's no like how you learn. I was telling my daughter, she, you know, everything's so precious nowadays. I'm trying to raise my kids in this, 
very different way, like um, like how I was raised, right? So not a lot of hovering, not a lot of helicoptering, yeah. do whatever you want. Um, uh, we, we were at Disneyland yesterday. I lied about my daughter's age so she could go on um, uh, whatever that uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark ride without oh, yeah. me because I, I have a three-year-old that couldn't go on. He was too short. Little fuckers too short. Can't go on the ride. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> right. That's a good one too. The, so the Raiders I lied and said she was 10 because I knew that, uh, that I'd read that 10, 10 and over you could go on the ride alone. I lied to get her on there. And that kind of let, it, let an eight-year-old go on a ride alone. I don't think there's many parents that I know that would allow that or mm. do that. Right. But yeah. I'm, so I'm trying to raise my kids in this new, new way, in this different way than how I raised my older kids. And uh, she said to me the other day, um, what's different about going to school? Like, because I drive them to school and pick them up. And I said, well, we used to walk to school. Yeah. And Mr. Montoya, the shop class teacher, used to pull over and give me a ride to school if he saw me. Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of times I was trying to get to the highway by 710 because I knew he would be driving by. If I got there at 725, I'm going to miss Mr. Montoya driving me to school in his little Volkswagen bug, right? Yeah. There's no teachers picking up kids on the side. Oh, of hell the road no. No and way. Bringing them to school. No. Not in, right? Definitely so not in California. A very different time. <laughs> yeah. Right? But I'm hoping for a time where my kids can ride their bikes home. It's about 2.1 miles. Yeah. Like I can't imagine many other parents are going to let their kids ride their school bikes home from yeah. middle school. But <laughs> anyways, I'm trying to do that so that they have autonomy. So, because I don't think a lot of these addict kids I'm dealing with in treatment and I still have a rehab center, yeah. um, that I'm, I, I, you know, it's got like, I actually got three locations, four locations, probably 50 60 clients at all at all times right yeah. so i am involved in treatment still it skews way young and like what you said there is this other like consistent uh older alcoholic population so a rehab nowadays has the fentanyl crowd like say Which you got 20 people in yeah. a rehab <laughs> there'd be 10 people 25 and younger all fentanyl and drugs then you got probably seven or eight 40 and 50 and maybe even 60 year old alcoholics. Yeah. And when it works right, when they mash and it's so fun other times, you know, cause there's an ebb and flow to rehab. I don't know if you've been to rehabs, yeah. many rehabs, but there's like a, there's like an automatic community that kind of gets born every 30 days, every yep. 60 days. And sometimes it's just magical. Like, you know, the old, the older crowd and the younger kids and they all care about each other and they're all looking out for each other and they all respect each other. And it's just magical. And then other times there's just no respect. And, you know, yeah. mostly the older crowd wants to leave because these fucking kids, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. these damn out. kids, jackasses. I'll always hear, I'll always hear like an alcoholic saying, Oh, I didn't come here to watch a bunch of kids play grab ass. And I said, <laughs> well, you came here because you have an alcohol problem yeah you don't dictate what goes on here well so you're trying to control yeah. everything that's i was you just gonna you know say what you need it's so funny because that isn't that like part of the issue right there in itself like i'm not gonna just do surrender. this because just this surrender. it's like yeah exactly let let me let me just be here and be in the moment and just let god take the wheel and here like i'm i'm done i'm just gonna show up and i'm gonna kind of do what i'm told in, you know for the next 30 days or whatever yeah yeah I, I know I was and that, uh, that Oh, go ahead. No, that is what rehab is. I, I yeah. don't, I don't really think you learn much. Uh, neurologically, you don't remember much. You know what yeah. I mean? If you go to rehab for 30 days, there ain't much you're going to retain. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, <laughs> like I, I went, I, not working right. <laughs> I did 30. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I, I did 30 days in Sebastopol, California. And I always tell people sometimes occasionally, oh, what was that like? Or how, how was it? Did it work? Um, I, I was ready. I soaked it in. The community aspect was pretty good. It's, it was actually very similar to what you're describing. And this was 11, 12 years ago now. But we had about half 
who were uh, addicted to heroin and they, they tended to be the younger crowd. And then there was another yeah. half that was more alcohol and maybe opiate, maybe prescription medication. There was a doctor who was in there at the time I was in there. I mean, yeah, there was yeah. a whole mix of people, but the one thing that I got out of it, the one thing was that community aspect. And it, that part was huge. It was the biggest part of it. I think going back and the hard part wasn't rehab. The hard part was going back home and trying to figure out how to be a dad now and how to be a husband and how to go back to work and all of that stuff, reacclimating into just this regular life after all I knew was drinking and doing drugs for many, many years. Um, that was the tough part, you know? Um, and I think that's what a lot it. of guys struggle with. Well, to me, like, so let's just analyze the different philosophies of the 12 step world. So there's the people that say the steps, the steps, the steps. I'm a historian of AA. I love it. I love all the history of it, how it came about. If you had Dr. Bob sponsoring you in 1940, you did the 12 steps in about 10 days. Mm. Right? That's fast. Then there's this little known aspect to it which was you're going to be of service the rest of your life, yeah. right? Meaning getting guys, helping them, getting people to meetings, starting meetings, speaking, helping, supporting, right? Um, you know, like, so basically community is like a majority of your experience in, <laughs> in the 12-step world for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, unless so you're going to go do another inventory and you're going to go do this and you're going to do Al-Anon, which I've done. I've just done Al-Anon while well, mostly my AA sponsor told me I should for years and I told him to shut up and then finally <laughs> I did. Then I did the steps in Al-Anon and gained way great insight about myself, mm. about control, about all the things I probably should have learned in my in my AA 12-step process. Yeah. I learned in Al-Anon. How I think that I can, you know, influence and control and yeah. manipulate people to my will. That's, you know, that's a real big problem for alcoholics. Oh, yeah. And I didn't learn it until I was eight years sober, 10 years sober in al mm. Right. But, um, but just to be a part of the community, that, that's to me so important. I always say there's only three states of being. I was a philosophy major in college. There's only three states of being in relation to the, to the 12-step community. That is entering, fully engaged in, or exiting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, the system is perfect because the people entering are probably asking the people exiting for help so that they can both become fully engaged again. See how yep. beautiful it is? It's, yeah, that's that's it right Now, there. nobody wants to say they're exiting. Yeah. You never think you are. <laughs> yeah, but you're on the tail end. And they're just like, okay, I'm done with but this the, shit. I've noticed the <clears throat> people that don't raise their hands yeah. to sponsor new people are the ones that usually use again. Yeah. It's just, I've been around it for 40 years, like yeah. I said. Like, if you're not if you're not open to, like, helping somebody, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Just, just what well, are you doing exactly? I, I had right? a client, I had a client recently and we were, I was trying to kind of help um, motivate him a bit and encourage him to, to go check out a meeting, you know, anyone pick one, find one that works for you, whatever. And I said, what's your, like, what's your biggest fear? Like, what is it that is kind of stopping you? Right. And, uh, and he said, well, I just don't think that I have anything to offer because you have all these people in there with all these years of of sobriety and you know i have like five days sober and so what would i have to offer you know by going in i said gosh man i said you're i said number one you're wrong <laughs> that's not true and number two man you are the reason that those that those people are in that room is just for you for you to go in there and for you to be a part of that because it's a yeah, circle sometimes you know? i think those but sometimes I think those people forget that. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's easy to forget. I tell you, it's easy to forget. How about for sure. this? I've been around so long, and I love sharing my experience, strength, and hope. I ended up sponsoring the guy who did an intervention on me. <laughs> oh wow! Because he relapsed. Dang, that's crazy. And then I was. Yeah. This is many years later, and. And I loved the guy, man. I just loved him. He passed away a few years ago. And I hated his funeral. I hate funerals. I don't. I don't yeah. want to go to him. 
Like everybody's Same. the greatest person who ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> Once they die. <laughs> I want them to say of mine. This guy was the most arrogant asshole. He helped a lot of people. <laughs> oh, that's freaking comedy. Why is everybody just the greatest human being that ever lived. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's freaking yeah. you know, and 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 at his funeral completely glossed over the fact that he had relapsed. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And just like, no, he was a human being. And he yeah. screwed up and he and he righted himself and he was he was fully open and about who he was and what he was and that was the beauty of him yeah not some mythology about him yeah right to me anyways it was funny so i say to that 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 client ears that that sponsor ears like dude i was talking to a guy today that ended up sponsoring the guy who did <laughs> who did the intervention on him <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen right you gotta I mean, stick yeah. around and you never know yeah. what's to come like you know somebody that I'm trying to help today might sponsor me in a yeah. year or two. Yeah. You know what I mean? Unless I, if I don't stay engaged, that's what yeah. I think. Engage. This is engagement, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Just talking about sobriety, just being a part of the community. So many of my friends that used again, just stop doing what I call the deal. Yeah. The deal is whatever comes your way that day. Mm, amen to that. That's, and if you avoid it, it, yeah, you can avoid it and go to a basketball game or whatever. Um, sure. But how many times can you avoid the deal? Yeah. Until you use again. I really am convinced that I will use again if I avoid the deal for mm -hmm. too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you right. fall, you fall out of the, you fall, there's a rhythm, there's a cadence, there's, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying too, about the, the 12 steps. You did the 12, you did the, the 12 steps in 10 days and then you were of service. And I think, um, I, I actually underestimate or overlook occasionally at times and need to be reminded how just even the podcast, uh, Sober Guy podcast has really kept me engaged and, and given me um, this this me this platform to talk just like you and I are doing right now, like just like you mentioned, just just having a conversation, just talking about, and then we send it out and hopefully some other people hear it and th it helps them. And that that whole process you know, every week, week after week, and then all the other stuff out in just the normal day to day has really kept me engaged. And I think that has a big part to do in addition to, you know, recovery work and, and group meetings and community, all that. Um, it's, it's been a huge, huge help, you know, and it's, it's important for people to find something that you love to do. We had a guy in something that you believe in something that yeah, you believe in. So 100%. I believe, I believe in, I believe in this thing, right? Mm. So much so that my politic is, is it, my belief in AA supersedes my politic. I wish more people were like that these days. So mm. you're not going to believe this, but I did work with Dr. Drew and it was pretty high visibility rehab. Yeah. And there was a president, I'm not going to name him, but I was not fond of him at all in about... I'm not going to say in the beginning of the 2000s. I, it was probably one one person I really disliked the most on earth. Yeah, and and that per, and he was sober. The president was sober, and he talked about being sober, mm. and then he wasn't. Right, and a friend of mine called me and said, "This is the weirdest thing. Guess who I got a call from?" And I said, "The White House." Mm. And they said, "How did you know?" And I said, "I saw it. I saw him drinking in Germany." I saw oh, wow. it. Yeah, you know, because I'm real conscious of like who's sober, who's not. Sure, like, sure. I saw the president of the United States who was sober drinking with Merkel, the president of Germany. Oh, yeah. Angela, <laughs> and good old Angela. Like, Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah. So, is she get anybody to drink? I guess so. It's Germany, you know. <laughs> hey, it's probably warm beer, some warm. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Um, I was at work and this whole thing was going on. Like they were going to do an intervention on the president. I kind of mm. knew about it and, um, ended up, he did get sober again or whatever, but this is a person I disliked the most on earth. And I was willing to put all that aside. If he's coming to my rehab, I love the guy. I want to help him. Yeah. I want to, I want to help him because I know what that must feel like. Yeah. That's good. Right. 
And if you're in Dallas, Texas, which I'm going to be on November 16th, maybe you go to 7:30 meeting and you see them. You know, what I mean? <laughs> there you go. Nice. <laughs> I'm telling you. But yeah. that. But think about that. This is the most. Yeah. This is a person just politically, socially, who I am as a punk rocker. This is a person I really despise the most. And that's all doesn't matter. Yeah. If he needs help. I want to help him. Yeah, that's good. And then maybe I'll get him to straighten up about this. <laughs> yeah, then we can talk about the other stuff later, but let's get you off the sauce first. Yeah. But, yeah. And that, I, yeah. I don't know of any other system like that. Yeah. Like work is pretty much, you know, you work amongst people who think like you, talk like you, walk like you, yeah. whatever, or you don't work there, right? Yep. Nobody's, I'm thinking our society is so divided now. I'm thinking like there's not a lot of blue cats and red cats working together yeah you know i i just can't imagine it. yeah um and i'm it, always called a trumper i'm always called a trumper because i disagree with so much uh, i'm just a common sense person i'm a democrat yeah. i always have been but i'm just a common sense person and there's not a lot of common sense on either side at this point <laughs> so when i'm standing up for common sense that's kind of against the blue team i'm labeled a trumper and then when I'm standing up against common sense on the of the red team, then I'm a libtard. <laughs> yeah. So you can't win. <laughs> well, so common sense can't win at this point. And common sense would be like, you know, simple stuff like, uh, like, like what you call somebody, right? I just said, why don't you call them their name? Why don't you just ask their name? Yeah. <laughs> but see, we're in a society that doesn't is so embarrassed or afraid of being embarrassed. They mm -hmm. never ask people names. Like I, I got a lot of people that come and go and rehab's pretty transient job. There's a lot of core people that will work there for 10 or 15 years, but it's a lot of people come and go nurses come and go. So I'm, I'm in the habit of like, Hey, I'm Bob. I'm, you know, I, I've never met you. What's your name? Like, it's not hard to say to people. Yeah. People don't do you it as much I mean? though anymore. Hey, what's they your name? They don't do it. Yeah. So just like call people by their name. Well, you know I, what I, mean? I think like, it goes back. It goes back <laughs> to what you talked about in the beginning of this too, the isolation piece, because I think media, uh, social media, regular media, this illusion of a, of a two party system, the, the left, the right, the infighting, the divide and conquer strategy, it's isolated people. And then you throw in COVID, right. Which completely destroyed right. people's ability to, um, to communicate, to be around people, um, to be in social gatherings that really psychologically hurt a lot of people. And I've even felt it in some senses in some of the work I do. I notice I have to, I'm a bit more conscious about making sure that I get, that I get out more and that I am talking to people and asking yeah, them yeah. their names so because yes. I, yeah, because the digital space well, can just, suck you in. I, it really can. I'll tell you this. So I wasn't a big fan of the online meetings, but I, you know, I'd yeah. go into them. I, I liked yeah. it in the beginning when the, when the people running the online meetings didn't know how to stop it and like porn would play. Like would play. <laughs> I remember like, hearing those stories. People come yeah. in and say, fuck you guys. Yeah. And they, people, the people running the meeting didn't really know the digital world. Yeah. How to shut it was all new. Up. And people would go on rants against AA and I would just yeah. cry. <laughs> but then everyone kind of figured it out after about six months. But the beginning of online meetings during COVID was so crazy. Yeah. Do you remember? It was like, wild. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. And so, so, I thought as soon as it opens back up, those COVID meetings will go away. They didn't. Now people are still haven't gone back to regular meetings, right? Yeah. Yep. And I know it's inconvenient or whatever, but I, I like you have to be around human beings. You can't you just be at home on your on your phone, or whatever. Yeah. So COVID is an interesting thing. So I have a bunch of kids. I have three kids and and an older son and a grandson. So I got like four little ones all the time, right? And they were they were driving me nuts and they were starting to get nutty during the lockdown and no school. Right. Yeah. And my daughter, Sydney was uh, talking to her. So I, like I heard her talking. I'm here in my office and her room's up down the hall a little bit to the right. I heard her talking. I thought somebody was here and you know, during COVID it's such a big deal that somebody come over to your house and oh, yeah. we could contaminate <laughs> some other pod. Or Unbelievable. Yeah. And so I'm walking in there and she's talking to herself. She was like five years old. I was like, what the, who are you talking to? Sid? And she's like, myself there's no one else to talk oh, to oh man 
man. Right? Yeah. And I just like, fuck this. And, uh, I, and I um, I have an organization called Don't Die. So I've been regularly involved with the opioid overdose death rate. And I was very, very, uh, you know, if you go to the CDC website, if you don't understand it, you get overwhelmed with numbers that don't seem to matter or whatever. But I'm pretty fluid with it because of the Don't Die movement. And I started looking at children COVID deaths and there were none. Mm. There were, mm -hmm. you know, 280,000 people over 75, but there were like, you yeah. know, 140 kids and we closed the schools. Yeah. Um, unbelievable. Right? Obviously, obviously, you know, this is not right. And then it just, it went on when they did the second year of school and there was not going to be, there was going to be online schooling. I was like, fuck this. I'm going to just start my own school. And I started my own school here on my property in the guest house. There you go. Yep. No masks, no nothing. Teachers wore masks. I thought it would be like eight or ten kids that we kind of knew, and it was just mm -hmm. um, it was just preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and uh, and I thought it'd be like eight or ten kind of punk rockers that live around here. We had two tracks. We had thirty four students. Wow. Parents of all walks of life were fed up with this nonsense. Yep. So what happens, like, we're having to hire teachers. My wife's a, uh, an educator, and she was doing it. And we're kind of, it kind of overtook our life. Imagine 34 families coming to your house Yeah, it's a lot. Day. It's a lot. <laughs> and kids. And, <laughs> yep. you know, and my neighbors were all cool about it. They thought it was so wonderful. But it became a little overwhelming. And, but it was so beautiful. Yeah. Like nobody, nobody got sick. No, no, no yeah. COVID outbreaks, no nothing. And the kids were thriving and I have a big property and there's a Creek and they would be outside and they'd go yeah. on field trips and stuff around in the Hills. And it was just, it was, Sydney says it was the greatest time of her life. Oh, that's awesome. But, but yeah, but the state came by. Oh, the state of course came they by did, man. We hear you're running an illegal wow. school here. And I said, uh, well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Just some friends from the neighborhood. Yeah, you know? It might it might look like it, but yeah. it's not. And they said, "Well, what what are you, what's going on here?" Mm. And I said, "The only thing I'll admit, it's a parent pod gone out of control. <laughs> the schools should be open, mm -hmm. right?" And they they were. You know, we held it together for another five months of them here constantly and finding me and oh, saying they're gosh, gonna man. put me in jail. And I said, You're gonna put me in jail for, for having teaching my kids. Daughter, yeah. Have, have, her, have her friends over. So, but eventually we got the license approved by the state. And then the final component of it was of uh, insurance because yeah, we, we were just using homeowners insurance. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't yeah. formalize it. And uh, no one would insure it because really? we live in an extreme fire danger zone. Mm. So no one yeah. would insure a school here. And I tried everything. I tried some old guy that sells insurance out of his house. <laughs> Can't you find me a policy? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> and he's I like, know. no, man, you live in an extreme fire danger. Yeah. You can't have you can't have congregate 30 kids there. And I was like, how about 22 yeah you know what i mean <laughs> is I was there like a magic number just, yeah and then and then it just the schools opened up overnight yeah all of a sudden imagine that right? imagine and, that uh imagine that it was just so crazy well, we and took, i think we, we've all just want to forget about it but it was so stupid the, the schools were closed we we took our so kids stupid. out we, we took the kids out they weren't wearing masks we were like no nah, you're not doing that so my wife homeschooled for the last five five years and then that's eventually what brought us to idaho because my daughter was going to start high school and um, I mean, just, we, we had to make some big changes and went through a lot of stuff as did so many other families out there. I didn't know that about the school for thing for you too. I mean, that's, yeah. that's amazing, man. And you just, that's that. I, I just feel like that's just such the resilient spirit that we'll do for our kids that we'll do for people that we'll do for our families. When, um, we're, we're when we see things back to the common sense piece, whether you're on the left, the right, that's what whatever saying, it is, common it's common sense. freaking sense, man. And like, the, there, there's a piece um, of of control at the top that doesn't want people using common sense anymore, and that's just it's really yeah, it's it really a, sad. It was it was a fun experience. You know who the music <laughs> teacher was at my school? Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, <laughs> and people from town would come up here just to see him. <laughs> I do not doubt it. That's freaking it, hilarious. It was, old, it was old punk rock, 
it was yeah. really punk rock and uh and uh it was like my last kind of stance against the yeah. status quo. But um, at a certain point, the state kept coming and talking to me. And 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 at a certain point, they said they were going to find me. And I said, well, how much? And they said, this woman who it was her case or something. And she said, Robert, why are you being like this? And I said, you've never met anyone like me. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure you've never met anyone yeah. like me. Mm-hmm. How much a day is it the fine? And she said, $180. I said, oh, that's fine. I'm rich. It's fine. Please leave my property. <laughs> yeah, bye. Because <laughs> I thought they were going to be like $1,000 a yeah, day. Yeah, 180 like, bucks. All we, right, just got a, we just yeah. got a kitty together who could chip in, and I paid the fines for a while. And then the fines went away. It was so, yeah. it was ridiculous. Authoritarianism. Like this man. little beautiful thing. <laughs> Yep. And the state would be here when the kids are laughing and down in the creek and making boats going down the creek and the yeah. state ladies would be here. Good it was just Lord. so like, and I would say, is, is, is this lost on you guys? Yeah. I thought no this was America, man. Here. I thought this was America. <laughs> like what's going on? Hey, I gotta, I gotta wrap up was, in about five well, minutes, but yeah, I wanted no. to ask you about the DNA for addiction too, okay, man. Okay, so even DNA, talking about that. you yeah. have children. You're, you're mm-hmm. a sober guy. You have children. Haven't you wondered whether they're addicts or not? Because <laughs> I wonder <laughs> yeah. all the time. And then when you have kids, like all teenagers, if you, I've had two, two teenagers now, two, two teenage boys, and you're always sure they're addicts. Now, I'm. My older son is in AA now, so he mm. is. But I could never know for sure. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? You're just looking at personality. You're looking at all these things that we associate with addiction and the personality of addicts. And But yeah. teenagers have addict personalities in general. And it's horrible for to project onto kids who maybe aren't addicts, you know, thinking they are. You know, all yeah. the parenting stuff we do. I've had friends of mine say... About their three year old, like he's an alcoholic for sure, like sober guy friends of mine. I was like, he's three years he's three. old. You can't do that to him. <laughs> he's over there pounding his so, milk bottle. <laughs> so, so I, I told this friend of mine, Sarah and Paul, he's good that have this lab. I said, you know, he's trying to figure out how to do a DNA test. I've been mm. saying it for years. Like, it's got to be a way to make it affordable or whatever. Cause we're always told it's a genetic basis addiction, sure. right? But there's no test for it, or the test was so expensive that you know it's like three thousand dollars or something. Yeah. So how do you get a test that parents could use as a tool? That's really what I was thinking. Hmm. And lo and behold, they came up with it. Now you know there's a bunch of like low risk, moderate risk kind of factors, but for the most part, it's just a tool to talk to your kids. When they're, you know, eight, yeah. you know, everybody asks me what age, like eight, nine, 10, 11, when they're heading into teenage years, they should be aware of drugs and, and what, yeah. what's going on and shielding them from it could kill them. I, I tell parents yeah. that all the time. You don't tell your 13 year old daughter about fentanyl laced Xanax. Yeah. She could die yeah. with her not knowing that. Yeah. Like, what are you saving her for, from? Well, I think you there's a lot I mean? of fear there. Just they don't, you know, they don't want to. They either don't know how, or they don't. They don't know enough about it. They don't think they know enough about it. But even beside that, there's enough information. I think just on the general basis that you could look up or just watch, watch the television. There's something that's going to pop up about it. And those talks are so important. I mean, I know we started talking to our kid, and they obviously know I'm in recovery and the work that I do too. So that kind of helps. But man, we've been talking to them since they were little. They ask questions, yeah. you know, they, they know, I don't, why don't, why don't you drink dad? Like why, you know, ha, have you ever smoked? That was a tough one. My son actually asked me that the other day. Have you ever smoked weed smoked dad? <laughs> and yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty honest with them, unfortunately, but yeah, I, I did, I did make some, some of those decisions when I was younger and here's, here's why, and here's how it affected yeah. me, you know? And, and if you had a thing that they could just swab and, and, you know, you'd have like, well, this this says you have the potential. Yeah. Right? And only 20% have the population have the potential. So you could be somewhere with your friends and they're all smoking weed. And there's a high probability that that's going to affect you differently than it's going to affect the other four people. Mm. 
Interesting. Right? Yeah. So just knowledge is power is what we used to say. Now I guess ignorance is power. <laughs> <laughs> just turn on the TV, Bob. <laughs> we become the exact, it's like, it's like Devo. Remember that band yeah. Devo? It stood for de-evolution that we're going to go backward. Yeah. Like it used That's to right. be knowledge was power. We weren't scared of knowledge about, about drugs, knowledge about sex, knowledge, uh, knowledge about, you know, corruption. Like we wanted to know just, I'm an adult. Tell me what's going yeah. on. Let me make a decision of what I think or want to do. Now it's just like, oh, no, no, no. You know, like we yeah, still yeah. don't know the truth about COVID. About yeah. COVID. We don't know. That, you know, <laughs> we don't even know who killed Kennedy is what I always say. <laughs> Man. Yeah. I definitely don't don't believe the the narrative we were told. I'll tell you that yeah. much about either one but, of those situations. You what I'm saying? 100%. Give me give me the information you got. Yeah. I, I should, you know, don't keep me in the dark. Right? But, but so Bob, a dumb, a dumbed down, a dumbed down population who is on drugs and um, not able to critically think and use common sense is very, very easy to control. And I think that overall, it, that's that's the goal at the end of the day. It, it seems it seems like to, to yeah. And I, you know, I'm even I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just think common sense. Yeah, we're a Critical service thinking. industry economy. We we can't we came from being a producing country to a service country. Mm -hmm. There's not enough jobs for everybody. So a large part of the population has to just, you know, that's why this $3,000 and just sit at home and play video games. <laughs> like, that's what you want in life? Yeah. That's what you aspire to? Yeah. Like, dude, I'd rather, I'd rather move to Costa Rica and sleep on the beach than do that. <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? When I first heard the, what is it called? The basic needs whatever the, you know basically universal needs income money or something universal yeah universal income, income. yeah I was it's, like, it's socialism like, straight you're up. just saying i yeah yeah you're just saying that that you just want me to sit somewhere on the sidelines do nothing of life yeah i'm not gonna sit on the sidelines of life yep. and no one should yeah i agree and so anyways that that kind of that that like go seize life that's what sobriety was to me i had yeah. been you know, just living in the, in no man's land for so many years. Yeah. I just, when I came alive again, I just wanted for everything. Like Jack Kerouac says, mad for everything, mad to talk, mad to be saved. Like just, just go. Yeah. And it's exciting. I want to help other people realize like there's so much good going on, man. Yep. Agreed. So much fun shit going on. And just get off the internet and, and Go stop live. taking drugs and see what happens. <laughs> right? That, That's my motto. My motto is stick around and see what happens. Yeah. It's not a complicated motto. Pretty simple. It's worth sticking around just to see what happens. That's right. a, I, that, that's why I enjoy listening to you. Uh, I've listened to you on other, other, other shows, obviously, but then talking to you as well is because you, you, you're able to take such a serious you know, subject addiction, which is, it, it can be very serious at times, obviously. Um, but you're also able to look on the brighter side and, and like how many times I know I've laughed a lot in this last hour since we sat here and we've been talking about different things and shifting gears and it's been a lot of fun. And I think that, um, it's a good example of you can address these things. You can be in community. You can have people around you. You can talk about serious things and you can still have fun too and, and, and be yourself and, um, you know, live life just well, like I'm you're saying, grumpy, man. I'm like, still, I, I know what you're saying, but I'm still a grumpy dad. So I took my kids. <laughs> I love Pink Floyd. My daughter's named after Sid Barrett. Pink Floyd's my favorite band. And we went inside David Gilmore. And, you know, he's older. And so he takes an intermission. So so we, we get there and I've got all, you know, two of my four kids and uh, and there's intermission and they, the kids were ready to go. And I said, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're chilling. About? Yeah. There's this intermission. I said, you guys grew up on fucking YouTube. It's over in 30 seconds. <laughs> yep, no, they want we're going to go get something to drink. And then he's going to come back and play more songs. Yep. And they were like, Oh, <laughs> dang dad. I know my son's the same, man. It's we try. As a matter of fact, we were going to watch uh we were breaking out Christmas stuff last night and we were going to watch daddy's home too. And, uh, my son, I, was, I don't, oh, I don't want to watch it. He can't sit for a whole movie. It's so hard for I these know. kids to sit, <laughs> and, and so we had to. We, we, he lasted about thirty minutes, and then finally he was out of there. But that's oh, it. Man. I'm telling yeah. you. So I'm at a concert that cost a lot of money, and my daughter said, 
Well, he already played your favorite song, which is Wish You Were Here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's, like, that's ironic. Yeah. I was like, yeah. My wife was wanting to go because it was cold. So we stayed yeah. for like three songs and then we left. Oh, man. And I was just like, I miss comfor- Comfortably Numb. Yeah. And, uh, but he did play Breathe. He played so many great songs. I, I just love Pink Floyd. And, that's and, funny, uh, But kids don't have the patience for a whole concert. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's cool to be able to experience that with your kids, though, even you know if it was a little shorter than expected. Good times, man. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you coming on. Right, well, um, everybody, have some fun. Get out there and live life. And, heck, yeah. You know, just like take a chance. Take a chance. Yep. You know what you got. That's what I was told. It, 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 you know what you got. You know what drugs and alcohol are giving you? You know what you got? It's not mm-hmm. all that great. It is miserable. Everybody's mad at you. <laughs> Give it a chance. Give something right. new a chance. Like, yeah. stop doing that and, like, try something else. It's not going to happen overnight, but yep. give it six months or a year. See if see if things are cooler. Yeah. That's the truth of it. I all right, I'll talk, it, to you guys. I'll talk to you some other time. But yeah, absolutely, you. man. I'd have love to have you Boise. back on. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. You can yeah, go sure. to Rehab, first Rehab winter, Bob. Oh, yeah. First, first, first winner in Boise. It'll be the first one, man. It's going to be fun. Uh, yeah, it's going to be cold. Man. Yeah. I've been there in winter. All right. All right, brother. Thanks, have man. Good. Yeah. Have, have a good one, man. Bye-bye. See ya. Yeah, bye-bye. If you're looking for ways to quit drinking, you can go to thatsoberguy.com. Thanks again for tuning in today. If you want to check out any of Bob's work, you can go to rehabbob.com. Also, dna4addiction.com. That's his website. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you next time. 